ignoring of this evidence. Well, we don't know the exact details because, you know, uh, Alaska's, we weren't there for the trial, but uh, I, I have a good handle on legal uh, cases and criminal cases, especially in the feds, and one of the specialties is they they withhold what's called exculpatory evidence, evidence that would show you're innocent, and they prepare only the evidence that shows your guilt. No, I don't know the exact details, but it probably wasn't just one recording. They probably recorded them several times, and what takes place is is, is these thugs, these undercover agents, provocateurs, meeting with him saying, you know, we want to kill the government, we want to have violence, and Schaefer's like, whoa, whoa, that's not my agenda, I talk at the Constitution. Well, they became uh, enraged that Schaefer wasn't going along with their plan of violence, and Schaefer the whole time didn't even know these guys were FBI agents. So there probably was several uh, recordings that if they were played in their entirety, or it maybe even be allowed uh, that uh, his defense could uh, play portions of it, it would show that he rejects violence. But of course, they don't do that in order to get, uh, they won't allow that so they could convict him. They actually wanted to kill him, not convict him. They just wanted to shoot him while trying to apprehend him. So the FBI placed plants within his own group and, and tried to incite him to violent speech as an excuse to kill him. Yes. This was an act of the FBI. Yes. And then they withheld evidence from court and put him in prison for a 26-year sentence. And, and you would think that, you know, members of government who've sworn an oath to protect the Constitution and our life, liberty, and property, it, it's difficult for most people to comprehend, you know, the level of deceit and evil that these government agents can perpetrate against what the people. What drives that, it, Michael? What drives this evil that they would want to violate their oath of office to kill an innocent American for, for what reason? I have no idea what would drive a person to do that. I, I can only guess that it's a sense of power, it's a sense of, you know, us versus them, that they don't just want us to be quiet. They want us to be submissive. They want to take control over everything that we do, which is, again, why we have 23,000 gun laws in this country, to make it difficult, if not impossible, for people to resist government tyranny. Well, we just saw what took place in Nevada. We saw a, uh, a citizenry who come to the aid of an individual who felt that his uh, his court case was unjust, the, the, the justice was falling on the wrong side, and the federal government came and took his cattle, and the citizens came together to support him. Some of them were militia, and then we saw the, we actually saw the government stand down. Uh, what is, are there parallels here? Well, one of the, one of the reasons I think the government st stood down, so to speak, or backed down, the one thing that's missing from, say, the footage in California where the police are pepper spraying uh, the citizens with their hands tied behind their back, okay, that famous footage, is in Nevada, some of the people were armed. And I think that's the difference between being able to withstand your ground or being run over by a corrupt government. Is If you're armed, you could stand your ground. If not, you're just, you know, uh, targets for the government. So what's next? What's next for the Schaefer-Cox story? Uh, well, I would encourage anybody who can help to go to SchaeferCox.com, you know, look over the information, get, get yourself aware. Uh, what he's after is to try to raise enough funds for his appeal. Um, if he's successful, he, he believes and the attorney believes that uh, there's enough, uh, let's say, um, errors in the trial court that if this got on appeal, he would win, prevail, and he'd be able to go home to his wife and to young children. If he doesn't, uh, if he's not successful at this, he will be a political prisoner for 27 years in a jail for crimes that he never committed, never even thought about committing. So what is the, what is the, the public support that he has now? You two gentlemen sit before me uh, advocating for his character. Uh, obviously, you are only two representatives of, of, of a larger movement that is here uh, in, because Schaefer Cox cannot defend himself. Tell me about the grassroots support behind him. Well, there is a conference call every Wednesday where we try to coordinate our efforts. Uh, we're sending out email 
it's advertising and education, letting people know that Schaefer is in jail. There's a much larger group in Alaska where Schaefer was very, you know, prominent and people knew him. So we're, we're trying to build on that momentum. And we do hope that the events happening in Nevada will bring many of the public to realize that, yes, it is quite possible, if not probable, that the government can overstep its authority, that it can use force against its own citizens. And if they see that to be true on television, then it lends some credibility to the fact that maybe this good-looking young man from Alaska really was set up. And, and that's the only way that you can define it as a, as a setup. Um, I think it's relevant to note that the facility that he is in is called the CMU. It's a communication management unit. And it's a place for domestic terrorists. And they very definitely control the information coming in or, you know, going out of the, the prison. So from my point of view, the government is still afraid of the truth that Schaefer has and his ability to motivate people with that truth. And so in addition to physically being in jail, they are also doing everything they can to curtail his communication in and out of prison. So what is, what, what's the ultimate outcome? Obviously, we, we want to see a trial overturned. We want to see him go back. Um, but how do we get to that point? Well, we're trying to raise awareness now from the feedback I got from trying to spread the word at this time is that uh, nobody knew what was happening. They didn't know this was going on with Schaefer. They didn't know what happened with his case or anything. So uh, right now, the, word, the, the most important thing is to get the word out about that he's a political prisoner right now and then get everybody over to the website, uh, uh, get them involved, uh, maybe to be a public outcry, uh, especially raise the funds so that an appeal can be done. And then once that happens, we hope the outcome will be he will be allowed to uh, be free and go to back to his wife and two children. Otherwise, he'll be condemned to be a political prisoner for 27 years. You know, it, one of the, the reason why they targeted him, he was touching on the two points that Dr. Edwin Vieira talks about that any sovereign state must, must have for free people, the power of the purse and the power of the sword. He knew that and he spoke clearly about that. The power of the sword means the people have to be in control of the guns, the, the authority, uh, the physical authority. And the power of the purse, gold and silver. Gold and silver is the money of the people. Paper money, Federal Reserve notes, is the money of big government. It's always in control of them, always out of our control. He was speaking on those two, and those are the most damaging because if we the people regain the power of the purse and the power of the sword, then we will have freedom. And that's what a tyrannical government never wants us to have. His name is Schaefer Cox, an American political activist and founder of the Alaska Peacemakers Militia. In 2011, the 26-year-old Schaefer was arrested allegedly for involvement in a plot to kill and kidnap state troopers and local judges. One of the people who feels he was set up is former Libertarian presidential nominee Michael Badnarik, who joins us in the studio today. Michael was also elected as president of the 2009 Continental Congress, where the Articles of Freedom were drawn up. The Articles of Freedom are a list of grievances and solutions delivered to Congress by the American people. Joining Michael is Rick Woes, who was the honorary Illinois delegate at the 2009 Continental Congress. Their connection to Schaefer is through the Continental Congress, where Schaefer had a very distinctive voice. They're here today to talk about his plight and how they believe he has been set up by the government. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thank you for having us. So, Schaefer Cox, you met him at the Continental Congress, and what was your first impression of him while you were there? And tell us a little bit about the Congress. The <clears throat> people have reached a boiling point uh, that in 2009, 48 of the 50 states got together and formed a Continental Congress where uh, delegates from each state came uh, to St. Charles, Illinois, and we actually had a Continental Congress, much like the uh, original Continental Congress. Uh, there, 
We uh, eventually, after 11 days, deliberated on various issues and came up with the Articles of Freedom. That's where we met Schaefer Cox, who was the uh, delegate from Alaska. And what, what was it? Tell us a little bit more about the Articles of Freedom, Michael. The Articles of Freedom are the result of our 11 day conference. A lot of people are upset with the government, they're complaining about a lot of different things. The Articles of Freedom are a compilation of those complaints and a list of remonstrances. They're instructions to the federal government and to the state governments on how to fix these uh, violations of the Constitution. What were some of the violations that were, were pointed out? Uh, First Amendment violations, we have um, places called free speech zones. Theoretically, you have to be in a particular area before the government will tolerate your, your speech, usually anti-government rhetoric, when in fact anywhere Americans happen to be standing is a free speech zone. Um, we had people talking about the Second Amendment and concluding that 23,000 gun laws in the United States are all unconstitutional because they infringe on your right to self-defense. Um, we had sections on the Federal Reserve, on the income tax, and so the Articles of Freedom didn't list all of the complaints against the government, just the most uh, prominent ones, and again, it also listed the solutions that we were requesting or demanding from the government to fix these problems. Now, Schaefer traveled from Alaska to St. Charles, Illinois, uh, and he was a very powerful voice. What was your, what was your impression of him uh, when you saw him there? Schaefer was an interesting guy. He was young, he's baby-faced, he was about 27 years old at the time, but he was his very unintimidating stature, but he spoke with such authority and such knowledge. He was homeschooled. I mean, by 23 years old, he was such an accomplished man already. He uh, uh, had all sorts of jobs. He ran his own construction company. Uh, at 23 years old, he uh, ran for a state legislature and uh, remarkably achieved 38% of the vote. Now, I want to I get a little bit further into Schaefer's story, but I'm, I'm intrigued about the Articles of Freedom itself and the document that was drafted by these elected members of, what, 48 states, you said. Um, when the Articles of Freedom were finally produced, now this was 2009, what was the result? And, and I know that it was served on the members of Congress, but what was the end result? Now, you were the president, Michael. The Articles of Freedom were duplicated by volunteers in each of the 50 states. They were delivered to Congress, the White House, the Supreme Court, and every single one of the state legislatures on April 19th, Patriots Day. So none of the legislatures could state they were unaware of our, our complaints. Um, we were hoping that the general public would pick up copies and show a little bit more enthusiasm but unfortunately, the, the efforts and the enthusiasm that we were hoping for never materialized. What do you think that is? Funding. <clears throat> you need money. There has to be money backing to be able to get out to the public. Uh, word of mouth only goes so far. and The Internet is good. And I think we did reach uh, tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of people, maybe even a million or two. But there's 314 million people in the country, and you need funding for that. Uh, and that's probably what we lacked. So this, now, now the, the Articles of Freedom have been produced. They're handed to the members of Congress. Schaefer Cox takes these documents back to Alaska and he begins to share them. What happens next? Well, Schaefer uh, was a force before the Continental Congress. Continental Congress only brought even more light to how well-spoken he, he is. And after the Continental Congress was over, he was doing conference calls and he was uh, making appearances and he had a big following. And of course, his, his message is, the Constitution, limited government, uh, you know, uh, people have certain rights, unalienable rights. Well, everything the federal government doesn't want somebody to be uh, saying. 
But unlike the average person saying it, uh, Schaefer was becoming very uh, noticeable and, and had a big following. So the federal government set out to stop that. Now, there are many delegates at the Continental Congress, and Schaefer being one of them going to Alaska, what, was there any other delegates that experienced any type of backlash for presenting this document to the public? Not that I'm aware of. Um, again, from our perspective, the Articles of Freedom just lost luster after we had written them. We didn't get nearly the amount of traction that we had hoped. And many of us in all the 50 states were promoting the articles. But as Rick said, Schaefer has an ability to speak and motivate. You know, when he talks, he's very concise, he's very succinct, and he has the ability to light that passion in people's hearts. So not only were the people of Alaska learning about the Articles of Freedom, but they were also inspired to do something about it. So then what, if, if he's such a passionate and inspired person and he's, and he's motivating people, why, why then suddenly this, this backlash against him? Well, it was, again, it, it, it wasn't just the Continental Congress that brought up about his, uh, his role in the Continental Congress that brought this about. He's been for years uh, a force of speaking about the constitutional limited government. Well, as you grow and you get more people, if nobody's paying attention, the federal government doesn't care, very little people. But he was getting larger and larger followings. Now, uh, he was known for having this Alaska militia, but uh, as he put it in his own words in a, in a letter that that's just what the media latched on to. He was doing all sorts of uh, uh, help to the community and uh, uh, it, the militia wasn't the only thing. Like I said, he ran for the state legislature. Uh, he was a foster parent. Uh, I mean, his... Well, being in Alaska, militias are pretty common because of the, because of the land layout. Because of the land layout and also because of the spirit, the spirit of independence in Alaska. I've been lucky enough to visit Alaska myself. And if you live there, I mean, you need to be able to survive, you know, on your own and with the help of your neighbors. And so the Second Amendment is very, very strong in Alaska, even without Schaefer Cox. So with his passion, um, it's not a surprise that the, the militia gained a lot of traction there. So what were the, what were the exact circumstances surrounding his arrest, Michael? I, I don't know the exact details. I was always catching up on it a little bit after the fact. But there were FBI agents who were agents provocateur. They were infiltrating Schaefer's militia. They were the ones promoting and instigating violence. And Schaefer is a very peaceful guy. Schaefer is trying to avoid violence. And, and he would reject their, their violent assumptions. Um, but it was one of the FBI agents who came up with this plan that if the police arrest one of our militia members, we're going to arrest two police officers. And that eventually escalated to suggest that if they kill one of us, we'll kill two of them. And the FBI created this artificial, this imaginary plan 241, which alleged that, you know, Schaefer was in charge of promoting violence against the government. Was there ever any moment of, of direct conflict? No, not violent conflict. When they set out to get him, uh, they used things like the mafia would do. They used things against you. Well, he's married. He had a, a little baby. They knew he loved his, his wife and his child. So <clears throat> the feds uh, created a uh, false allegation that he was uh, mistreating his child. Who ever heard of the federal government reporting about to the children's services that uh, there's some abuse going on? That's all local concern, uh, but that was part of the feds' plot. Well, then the Children's Services got some sort of no-knock warrant uh, that they were going to serve with a SWAT team authorizing violence is unheard of. Whenever, whenever you have a report of child abuse in this state or any state, the first thing is they ring your doorbell and come and interview you and see, which they would have found no abuse. But for some reason, some force was working behind the scenes that he didn't understand, and it was the feds. So what brings you here today? What is the mission you hope to accomplish today 
in regards to Schaefer Cox and his story, because he's, he is currently in an Illinois federal prison. Yeah, Schaefer was eventually railroaded. Well, maybe we could get more into detail of that, but just to cut to the chase, he's, he was railroaded into false charges uh, in a federal court, sentenced to like 26 years or something, and he's currently in a like a high security prison in Marion, Illinois, uh, away from his wife and two kids. And if we, if he doesn't raise enough money for his appeal, um, he is going to end up sitting there for 27 years, and he has an excellent chance on appeal of getting this overturned because from what I understand about the trial, it was a kangaroo trial. So you, you say he was railroaded. Can you provide some more details into that? One of the um, agents for the FBI was admitting that at this point in time, Schaefer had not done anything illegal. There was nothing that they could possibly arrest him for but they were hoping to use the love of his children against him. And the FBI agent admitted in a recording that if we try to kidnap Schaefer's son, that Schaefer would probably resist, and that would give us, the FBI, the excuse we need to shoot and kill him. And once we've killed him, the Schaefer-Cox problem goes away. Now, that recording was never allowed at the trial. So, clearly, if the jury had heard that recording, it would, it would demonstrate in very clear terms that the FBI was attempting to fabricate evidence or create a situation to give them the justification they wanted to, to kill Schaefer. And what many people don't know is that as Schaefer became more and more aware of this FBI scheme, he was trying to leave Alaska. He, he was going to avoid the situation. He was going to, uh, I'm told he was going to bring his wife and children to the lower 48 states and, and just basically run and hide from the FBI. And the undercover FBI agent stole the battery out of his car so that Schaefer was immobile, could not leave town, and gave Schaefer, uh, told Schaefer a lie, told Schaefer that there was a truck driver who was willing to smuggle his family out of the, you know, out of Alaska, and that this truck driver was, you know, going to be arriving very, very soon. And it was, it caused enough of a delay so the FBI was finally able to arrest Schaefer in Alaska. So this tape recording that was never allowed into court, who's responsible for the, for the, the ignoring of this evidence? Well, we don't know the exact details because, you know, uh, Alaska's, we weren't there for the trial, but uh, I, I have a good handle on legal uh, cases and criminal cases, especially in the feds, and they're, one of the specialties is they they withhold what's called exculpatory evidence, evidence that would show you're innocent, and they prepare only the evidence that shows your guilt. No, I don't know the exact details, but it probably wasn't just one recording. They probably recorded them several times, and what takes place is, is, is these thugs, these undercover agents, provocateurs, meeting with him saying, you know, we want to kill the government, we want to have violence. And Schaefer's like, whoa, whoa, that's not my agenda. I talk at the Constitution. Well, they became uh, enraged that Schaefer wasn't going along with their plan of violence. And Schaefer the whole time didn't even know these guys were FBI agents. So there probably was several uh, recordings that if they were played in their entirety, or maybe even be allowed uh, that uh, his defense could uh, play portions of it. It would show that he rejects violence. But of course, they don't do that in order to get, uh, they won't allow that so they could convict him. They actually wanted to kill him, not convict him. They just wanted to shoot him while trying to apprehend him. So the FBI placed plants within his own group and, and tried to incite him to violent speech as an excuse to kill him. Yes. This was an act of the FBI. Yes. And then they withheld evidence from court and put him in prison for a 26-year sentence. And, and you would think that, you know, members of government who've sworn an oath to protect the Constitution and our life, liberty, and property, it, it's difficult for most people to comprehend 
you know, the level of deceit and evil that these government agents can perpetrate against what the people. What drives that, it, Michael? What drives this evil that they would want to violate their oath of office to kill an innocent American uh, for, for what reason? I have no idea what would drive a person to do that. I, I can only guess that it's a sense of power, it's a sense of, you know, us versus them, that they don't just want us to be quiet. They want us to be submissive. They want to take control over everything that we do, which is, again, why we have 23,000 gun laws in this country, to make it difficult, if not impossible, for people to resist government tyranny. I'm trying to raise money here for uh, an appeal. Who is his representation and who has represented him thus far? Well, right now, Schaefer has a court-appointed attorney, a woman from Seattle, who is blatantly anti-Second Amendment and who has demonstrated over and over again that she does not want information that would be beneficial to Schaefer's situation to be admitted into uh, evidence. So she is actually working against Schaefer's best interests. We have another attorney who was there and is very eager to help, but we're have some legal stumbling block blocks right now that we're trying to get the coin deported attorney removed and uh, another attorney uh, substituted. So Schaefer, what, what, what are those stumbling blocks? Uh, Schaefer has written a motion to the court uh, trying to allow himself to go pro se, meaning to, to handle his trial without any attorney at all. Um, and I think that's kind of a a maneuver. If he can become pro se, that would eliminate the court appointed attorney, and then later he would be able to add uh, the attorney of his choice. Are they, are they allowing him to represent himself? Well, from what Schaefer has on his website, uh, he's able now finally to do some letters or communications, and they post it on his website. Uh, he says mostly that he has a he has a good attorney, a very good attorney that. Uh, if a certain amount of funds could be paid to him, he will take the appeal and probably prevail. Uh, I do not know his court-appointed attorney, but I have experience with public defenders and court-appointed attorneys, and almost unanimously, 100%, they don't know the law, don't care about the law, they just want a plea bargain, they're angry if you go to trial, they don't conduct trials very well. Um, their, 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 their caseload is, they're overloaded. They don't have time to put in on your case. So there's no way he had competent counsel at trial. There's no way he did. How old, I mean, are, how old are his children? At the time all of this started, I think that uh, one child was six months old and the other was like two years old. And it's been a couple years now. So, but they are still, you know, just approaching school age. Yeah, and it's amazing how his poor wife and two children, he was a great provider, hard worker. He actually had uh, a little bit of wealth. All that has been wiped from him. Property has been taken, everything. He's been devastated. His wife and children are left out in the cold now. He's in, he's in prison. He's in literally like a secret prison uh, far from where his wife and children could even visit him. It's, it's what they're doing to him is just, uh, it's typical of what you would see maybe in like uh, the old gulags in Russia or uh, you know, in Nazi Germany, but it's not something that should be going on in the United States. Well, Michael, as president of the Continental Congress 2009, uh, you got to witness Schaefer firsthand and his character. What are your final thoughts on the, the execution of this trial uh, and the outcome that you're hoping for? When I first met Schaefer in St. Charles, I was really impressed with his ability to articulate the ideas. You know, a lot of people can talk, but it's hard for them to be concise. Schaefer was really excellent, and he was also very gentle, and I, I consider him a, a really good friend, even in the short period of time that we worked together. The first time I heard that Schaefer had been arrested for threatening the police, I disavowed that. I don't believe that it happened. It's just not in his character. And I'm hoping to make a short pilgrimage down to Southern Illinois 
to actually visit with Schaefer face to face. And, you know, hopefully people will be able to go to his website and write letters. If nothing else, it would, you know, provide moral support for somebody who's standing up for our freedom and is now paying the penalty, you know, perpetrated by an evil government.